Hello everyone. Today we're going to be taking a closer look at some parts of the article by Lucas having to do with environmental management practices in organizations. My name is Joe Strahl and I teach environmental studies at Malmo University. This lecture is part of a course having to do with organizations and their strategies in the area of the environment, MV241E held during the fourth term in the Environmental Studies program at Malmö University. So we'll be taking our closer look at Lucas, the article by Lucas. I will be conducting two mini-reviews around the topics of what she refers to as human capital and social capital. We can see the article. The, this article is about 10 years old at the time of recording this lecture, and yet it is still very relevant. For everything uh, today in the year 2022, where this lecture is being held. Lucas, in her article, attempts to look at various what she refers to as environmental management practices. Either these are environmental management practices that she herself has identified, or she has identified through reading the academic literature having to do with environmental management. What kind of activities, what kind of practices do companies or organizations in general carry out with regard to the environment? And how could these be classified? She classifies them according to four different kinds of capital. Physical capital, human capital, social capital, and organizational capital. Working environment issues could be considered a part of human capital. In the remainder of this lecture and the following lecture, which I have chosen to place on YouTube so that students in various courses can see this regardless of the course, and also you who might be watching this on YouTube and are considering um, the program of environmental studies at Malmö University, you might find this of interest. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the human capital and social capital parts the environmental management practices that Lucas identifies and classifies as falling under the categories that she has of human capital and social capital. Here we can see parts of her article. We can see a table which takes up two pages which shows the large number of environmental management practices that she has identified and that she classifies. Here, in this lecture and the coming pre-recorded lecture, I am only interested in the blue area and the green areas. These are the human and social capital environmental practices that she identifies. So in the rest of this lecture and the next lecture, I will be taking some, not all of the practices or the categories that she identifies in the area of first human capital and then social capital. And I will be looking at these in more depth. I will carry out a literature review of scientific or academic articles dealing with those matters that she has in her management practices. <clears throat> and then we can ask ourselves whether the arguments brought up by Lucas and strengthened by these, these articles are reasonable and what might be lying behind the observations made in a number of these articles. You, as a student in this course, might find some of these things interesting. Some of these articles might be useful for you in this course or in coming courses in the Environmental Studies program. Consider also that a number of these articles are approximately 10 years old. There could be more recent articles which you yourself as a student in an environmental studies program could find and could use in your work. So let's begin with human capital. In the article, what Lucas means by human capital are, of course, the employees, the humans employed in an organization. We see, that it's the, we see that it's the employees, their knowledge, their skills, their capabilities, and their attitudes. And this, taken together, is what she refers to as human capital. 
Now, if you read more closely in the article by Lucas, you can see that she makes a clear distinction between what she refers to as human capital and social capital. I'm not going to go much any further into that. You can read more in the article yourself what the distinction that she makes there. <clears throat> but the important thing here to consider is that we're talking about humans, people as individuals in organizations, their skills, their abilities, their attitudes, and so forth, and how the organization invests in the individuals and therefore invests in the company. And as is argued in Lucas and in other articles which I'll be bringing up, not only is it an investment in individuals and the company, but by investing in individuals and we have an environmentally aware or sustainably oriented company, we are also investing in the environment or investing in sustainability. Now, when it comes to human capital, it's natural to think about the terminology used today as in terms of human resource management and what are the typical kinds of activities that are being carried out by human resource management in the organization in question. Well, obviously, we need to have more employees and the recruitment process. <clears throat> and part of the recruitment process could be, and part of the recruitment process could be in interviews of potential employees. What else could be included in this? The internal training of staff and the internal training of employees and their education. We can make a distinction between maybe technical training concerning a particular kind of object or item or step in some sort of process versus more general education. Human resource management also might be involved in how we distribute the various employees throughout the company. That they have specific competences which are best suited for the company in particular parts of the company but also we might want to make combinations of particular competences, orientations, skills that we need in a particular kind of activity in the company. Furthermore, there is uh, perhaps uh, the retain furthermore, there is the retaining of employees. We have made an investment in, in terms of intellectual capacity, time and so forth in our employees. Uh, they are engaged with us. <clears throat> they have improved they have learned new things, they have helped us in various ways, and we probably would like to keep at least the majority of our employees at any given time. But perhaps in the future we want to employ new employees and we don't need quite as many of the others. Or they could be moved to new positions within the company based on their improved competence in some areas that has been beneficial for the company. I have uh, an additional point saying letting go of staff, but we'll just ignore that for the moment. So if we have the recruitment process and the other steps that we see here, if we we're going to translate these into some sort of environmental concern, if we were going to translate them perhaps also into an organization that's thinking about sustainability, and that's part of the argument that Lucas is making here, that there are environmental parts to human resource management, but most companies don't seem to be thinking about human resource management and making their organization more environmentally friendly or making their organization more sustainable and integrating these ideas into human resource management tasks, such as recruitment, such as the recruitment process, such as training of staff, such as the retention of staff, and also the distribution of staff. So if we were going to translate these, and that's the green arrow that's supposed to be shown here, if we're going to translate that from a non-environmentally oriented company or a non-sustainably interested company to a, a company organization which is incorporating the environment in their strategic objectives and in their vision for their, their role in a sustainable society, then these, these areas of which are maybe very traditionally run in human resource management need to change. And apparently, according to Lucas, that there are organizations that have made these changes, but they might be not all that uh, common or all that often. So we should, when we're thinking about working with the environment in a company, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just be thinking about environmental management systems. We shouldn't just be thinking about investments in new technology needed in our manufacturing. We should also, we should also be thinking about um, all these points with regard to there are our staff, are human resources.
And through this, management's understanding of the role of the employees in how their company is changing to become more sustainable, how their company is becoming more environmentally friendly. There will be a learning process on the part of management how this might be done. And as HRM is increasingly thinking about the environment or sustainability, both in their relationships with employees, but also in how they carry out their everyday business, this should encourage this and improve this kind of learning process on the part of management. We can see the different colors, dark blue, purple, red, and light blue. We have a new diagram here. And the dark blue is translated directly across to recruitment. We, recruitment, we have the two purple in, in purple uh, in terms of um, um, education and training, but also the education and management um, and the management of the company, not, not just the employees. Uh, what is marked in yellow is something which is somewhere both training, but also uh, something else having to do with evaluation of employees and the distribution of them within the company, and that has to do with and that has to do with risk and preparedness. That's why I made it in yellow, and then it's sort of both red and purple text there. And the distribution of employees we can approximately see here has to do with the yearly evaluation and other things dealing with employees uh, and their evaluation both in terms of what they have done and what they would like to do, but also some sort of reward financially, but also that they are noticed by their most immediate managers and what they have done and what they have achieved and praise and credit for what they have done. Uh, the whistleblower po point there is perhaps not something that would be considered normally HRM, but maybe that's something which the HRM staff should be thinking about, or somebody else, that there's something wrong in the area of the environment, or things are going wrong and somebody needs to, without threat of repris uh, reprisal, to uh, be able to say something to speak their mind. So it's, it's in organizations that have some kind of environmental concern, some kind of environmental management, all of these points are of course important and relevant. Now, one of the arguments that Lucas makes in her article is that uh, an organization's long-term success, success in the area of the environment is going to be, to some extent, determined, about, uh, d determined based on the investments in human capital which the organization makes. There is a foundation. If your employees don't have all that much environmental interest, don't really care, don't have enough training, then your environmental performance as an organization is going to suffer in all likelihood. She speaks about unwritten knowledge as a resource in the company. She also speaks a, a, about uh, human resource management routines to sort of grasp the areas where people are developing their competence and maybe even try to make connections between people in the organization who otherwise don't have any connections with each other but maybe could collaborate in other ways. Um, there could be people working on the environment in a company which is large enough that I, the environmentally interested employee, have no knowledge about, and my most immediate boss might not also know either. So therefore there needs to be more communication in this area, and perhaps HR, HRM, could have that as one in a number of categories of lo looking at their staff and facilitating that communication. Now we can ask ourselves, what Lucas is talking about, are these reasonable arguments? I'm going to investigate whether Lucas's arguments are reasonable, and does she have support in the academic literature that I could find in a mini-literature review which uh, would provide that support? support? Are these reasonable arguments? On page, 500, on page 549 in her table, she has under her Roman numeral point, uh, number, Roman numeral number two, investments in human capital environmental management practices. And she has a number of points under this. We can see here that she has recruitment as um, in her table listed A. Under B, she has environmental education and training, environmental education of management and risk and preparedness. She has under C, employee assessment, and also whistleblowers and environmental problems. And what we can see in this uh, slide here 
is that the rest of my lecture here is going to deal with 1, 2, and 5 from the table. Recruitment, environmental education and training, and employee assessment having to do with environmental management practices. Wagner, him or herself, in an article for 2013, conducts a literature review covering the area of, of recruitment, looking at uh, human resources, the human resource management, uh, the function of this, of this activity and sustainable development in a variety of different settings. Um, with the idea that perhaps this or that's part of, of a company or an organization, human resource management, should be thinking more long term than they are, that there should be a greater diversity of people who are employed there to reflect an even greater diversity of opinions and attitudes and knowledge within society, and that they need to become increasingly professional. If a human resource management function in a company is thinking about the environment and thinking about sustainability and or has been tasked by upper management to include the environment and sustainability, then this outward profile in the way they interact with potential employees and with other organizations might function as a magnet to draw people with competences and interests in the area of the environment and in a sort of sustainability mindset that otherwise would be less likely to be attracted to this organization. This means that you will get more applicants that have some sort of explicit or implicit environmental or sustainability interest which means that you are building uh, the capacity of your organization to work in a more environmentally friendly way or in, era, in a way which is more conducive or sympathetic to uh, sustainability. And we can have this as, uh, link this back to the resource-based view of the firm in Hart, who is referred to in Lucas uh, herself, that employees are the key to success for any kind of organization. If we match the employer values and uh, the employee values, more or less, in the recruitment process, then we are building upon success potential. Of course, there is always the problem of bounded rationality, that if you have a company with management and human resource management who have the same background, very little diversity, and then you try to get people that match you, then that means that your company will send, tend to continue moving in the same direction and not be open to new ideas. Here the argument is that if, if the environment or sustainability, whatever that is the future, on the market or of necessity because of, say, planetary boundaries, uh, then it's good for the company, it's beneficial for the company that, w that have an environmental interest, that the values of our employees should have some sort of environmental component, or with a broader perspective, sustainability instead. So Wagner carries out a literature review, uh, and we can see the first part of the literature review, purple text to purple text. Um, and the existence of environmental management systems, the existence of corporate social responsibility on the part of an organization, uh, and how this is connected to recruitment and retaining staff and so forth, uh, this seems to increase motivation among existing employees. They looked at uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in the literature review. Um, and so this means that the more the company has corporate social responsibility, the more the company has an environmental management system, the more the employees seem to be motivated. Motivated in general. <clears throat> it also seems to suggest that they are more easily able to keep their staff, which they have made investments into. If we instead look in the part of the article which has not to do with the literature review itself, but their actual investigations among companies in uh, Germany in the beginning of the decade 2010. They could find a degree of connectionness between what they referred to as staff degree of satisfaction or happiness at work 
uh, with the degree of establishing an environmental management system. So there seemed to be some sort of a connection between there. Then the question we can ask, is this a causal relationship? That an environmental management system is established, or perhaps a corporate social responsibility program is established, um, does this lead to greater amount of staff satisfaction, satisf greater amount of staff satisfaction or happiness at work? Or is there something else that is behind this? This diagram here that we're looking at, if there's this relationship between satisfaction at work and environmental management systems, is it actually because of the work of management? Management does certain things, and they think that environmental management systems are important. Management does certain things, and employees' uh, satisfaction increases. So it isn't that environmental management systems lead to satisfaction. It is that there's something behind it other activities leading to environmental management systems, which also leads to satisfaction on the part of employees. That is not answered in the article, but they just see some sort of connection here, these green arrows. Now, moving from Germany to Korea, South Korea, we have an article by Kim, Lee, Lee, and Kim, approximately the same period of time, and they were looking at corporate social responsibility activities. And they found that the existence of corporate social responsibility activities on the part of organizations, that is to say, essentially companies, in South Korea, led to employees being more oriented to their company, which in turn leads to a more positive view of the company on the part of the employees, and therefore more positive engagement. More engaged employees, probably better performance of the company. That would seem to make sense there. <clears throat> but just like in our previous uh, literature, uh, Wagner in Germany, where the question is, what was the cause and what was the effect? Here, the effect is indirect. It is what they refer to as a perceived external prestige. So the employees are asking themselves, how does the outside world view the company that I am employed in? And one of the ways the outside world views my company or the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Activities, that the company is undertaking and communicating about. So then it becomes a question of the employees in the company. What do they think that the outside world will think about the company? And a company with good corporal social responsibility would be seen as more prestigious. Therefore, I work for a more prestigious company, and therefore I have a more positive association with the company, and therefore I'm engaging more in the company. So it's a sort of a roundabout way and a roundabout explanation, but apparently in this circumstance, at that particular point in time, it was successful. It was important. External engagement in corporate social responsibility indirectly leads to greater employee engagement. And with greater employee engagement, they are more likely to be working with, if this is something the company is interested in, sustainable development or in uh, environmental issues. And having some kind of CSR suggests that the company is looking beyond just a limited time frame and is thinking about its role in society. Moving on to the next academic study in academic literature. We have Bernd, Baker, and Thompson. They had a hypothesis. The two previous studies were just observations. Here we see that there was an experiment which was carried out. This was carried out in North America. And there was a hypothesis that if you're looking for a job, and you see the various kinds of announcements or job pages on the internet or wherever it is, and you, or, and you see listings, that how the job is described and how the company is described might influence whether you apply or not to the job. And they were thinking that if there were what they referred to as environmental messages, 
in the announcement, then that might attract certain people to, uh, people to, uh, to apply for the job. And greater amounts of perceived environmental messages might lead to a greater number of people who actually submit an application to a job. So what they did was they had recruited volunteers. I believe if this is correct, these were people in universities that a year or two later might be actively searching for a job. And they made fake or fictitious job announcements. They made up pretend companies. And some of the companies had a clear environmental message describing their company and the sort of job that was of interest, and others did not. And the hypothesis was supported. The volunteered people, the, those, who are, those students that were recruited, did not know what was taking place in the study, but they just were supposed to respond to these job announcements, which they believed were real. So that meant that the, the environmental messages had an impact on potential applicants. Those who participated in this study, if they had their own stated environmental interests or not much in the area of environmental interest, it didn't matter. There was an attraction, there was a magnet behind this. So the environment in an advertisement for a job led to greater interest on the part of potential applicants, regardless of their own environmental interest, their own personal or private environmental interest. And this led to a greater likelihood to be interested and a greater likelihood to submit an application. Very interesting. Showing us the importance of the role of human resource management. Moving on to another article, and I'll just read the quote here. Potential applicants use information about a company's social and environmental performance as a signal upon which to base inferences about working conditions, which affects organizational attractiveness. So here we have additional connections. The applicants believe that if there is some sort of environmental message in it, that in all likelihood, the work environment, how you enjoy your work, how you are treated at work, your ability to influence your work situation is greater, and therefore this is a more attractive workplace. Whether it is or not might not necessarily be the question, but this is the perception on the part of the potential employees, the applicants. Now, the suggestion also that Vilnius and Jones makes here is that yes, there is something called greenwash, but we suspect that greenwash doesn't work when it comes to job applications. It might work to convince consumers to do something because they have a temporary relationship with the project, pro the product, but it's quite different being an employee. That's probably going to be a long-term relationship perhaps at least three years, five years, ten years, perhaps, uh, a consumer might not have as much brand loyalty and can switch to something else when they realize that it's just greenwashing. And they suggest that this doesn't, greenwashing doesn't work when it comes to potential job applications. So can we reach some kind of conclusion thus far based on this limited amount of literature review? in support of Lucas's arguments or not. What we can see is the recruitment process attracts certain applications, applicants, certain kinds of applications and certain kinds of applicants. This is very clear. Whether this is done on purpose or is an unintended consequence of something, it occurs. There is documentation about this. So the environmentally interested company should do well in thinking long-term of what kind of messages it has in the recruitment process. If they're not including that, if they're not thinking about that, they might be less likely to attract people that have a private 
and therefore perhaps a professional environmental interest. If we think long term, really long term, company A that has an environmental interest but doesn't do much about human resource management or they spend quite some time to make changes in human resource management. Company B that as a part of a broad idea of environmental management and change in the organization, wants to make sure from the start that human resource functions in the companies are, are also environmentally aware, that their change will occur there as well. It's not just the question that there's an environmental job. It has to do with all kinds of jobs out there that are possible for the company that it's developing. So in the long term, as we recruit more and more employees that have a private, but also a professional environmental interest, then uh, through time, a number of years, and the number of decades, as some people retire and new people come, we are replacing the entire company's workforce with people now who have a much more, a greater level of environmental competence, interest, more positive attitudes to the environment, skills, and so forth, regardless of what they then do in the company, which would mean there would be some sort of positive reinforcement that takes place within the company. It would also mean that company B, that started working seriously this to begin with, will have a, a faster in incorporation of, of environmental thinking in part, on part of more and more of its employees, opposed to the other one that waited three or five or seven years before making some sort of changes in human resources. When this is taking place long enough, then there will be new employees in the human resource function who have some kind of environmental interest, and therefore they will make sure, they will be self-driven to do these kinds of things. And then we'll be sending out even more kinds of signals that will function as a magnet to be able to pull in those with the greatest environmental interests and competences and skills, even for parts of the company which traditionally don't have all that much connection with the environment. You could replace the term environment with sustainability here. That would also work. And this would end up being that the human resource function in a company helps to sustain sustainability. So we had our tentative conclusion there. Let's move on from recruitment to education, training, and environmental performance. Uh, here we have some additional researchers that we can see here, purple text and green text. The purple text has to do with the chemical sector in the United States, and the red text has to do with car manufacturing in Spain. Two different countries, two different kinds of sectors. <clears throat> and if there are similar kinds of results of studies in, in two different countries in two different sectors, then this might suggest that this is a much more universal kind of, of um, result that we can find here. So, according to the study about the United States and the chemical sector, companies that are innovative in the area of the environment have the best environmental performance, and the common success factor in all of these companies had to do with their employees, their skills, and their abilities. Makes sense. But we need to have some sort of academic study that confirms this. The other study in Spain, the training of staff, the education of staff, was a prerequisite or a precondition for the work which took place in the area of the environment in the company, and it was also success with external relations. If you know enough about the environment, you have a certain pondus, you have a certain comfort and familiarity with environmental issues, and you can communicate more easily with anyone outside of the company, thus seeming to be a more legitimate and true environmental interest on the part of the employees, which also is reflecting upon the company. Sort of linking back to that Korean study, having to do with the perception of the company. Moving to another country, Canada. 
This wasn't any particular sector, but they were looking at the, what they referred to as the environmental activities in Canadian manufacturing companies and comparing this to what they referred to as the environmental performance of the company. Environmental performance has to do with the amount of uh, energy which is used, the degree of recycling, the amount of emissions, and so forth. The majority of the companies that had the greatest improvements of performance per program, and when we can see here what it says in more detail is that there were um, that they broke down what companies could to do into nine main kind of activities or programs, what they called them. Uh, so the companies which were more successful, the majority of ones that had the greatest amount of environmental improvement per uh, environmental activity in the company, were the ones that had an emphasis on staff training. Now, it's also interesting, they weren't out looking for that. This was something that they discovered, incidentally, in their article when they were carrying out their research. Switching continents and countries again, now we're in France, and more than 500 companies were studied by these two researchers. They wanted to see if there were any connections between environmental work and employee productivity, with the idea that more environmental work, perhaps leading to greater employee productivity. That was at least the idea in the article here. <clears throat> and what do they say? They say the following. Our results show that the adaptation of environmental standards is associated with higher levels of labor productivity and that improved training in interpersonal contexts mediate this relationship. So if a company has an ISO 14001 certificate, or if it has participates in the AMAS in the EU scheme, then there's a greater likelihood that you have more productive employees. And then there is this mediation factor here that leads to that. Again, we can go back a number of slides and ask the question of satisfaction and environmental management systems. Was that the connection? Or was it something else that was behind it? The same kind of question will be here. Ultimately, that study and this study, it's a question about the attitudes and actions of management that are then reflected in ways that seem to be connected to each other. An additional study, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head where this was located, companies and their managers often assume that employees know the environmental decisions and routines or the sustainability policies and decisions and routines in the company. But their study seemed to suggest that this was very dangerous to make that assumption. It's assumed that this is made and communicated out to the employees. Management is done. They don't have to do anything more. Uh, and I can know that as an employee in my university, and I suspect this is the case in many universities, most employees don't know in detail all of the policies and decisions and so forth. Um, and that this is sort of assumption that there's this sort of passive diffusion out of environmental decisions or sustainability policies is probably a dangerous assumption to make. When uh, interviewed, the employees, their knowledge about the environment or sustainability policies, decisions, routines in the company tended to be very much related to what their own area of work was. They sort of filtered out what they needed to know for that very specific task, which they did most of the time. They didn't have, really have the big picture, is what the results of this study says. So this means that with the exception of very few people in most organizations, there never develops a collective understanding about what the environment means for the company or what sustainability means for the company or whatever organization it is, unless there's more training and there's much more, much more communication among employees and that management makes, stops making the assumption that there's some sort of passive diffusion of the various policies and decisions and routines. This means that understanding of the central policies and what they mean for the company ends up being, as the article suggests, fragmentary. Not good. 
So we had some conclusion before. Let's see if we have uh, at least one additional conclusion and possibly a, a, a third conclusion. The first conclusion has to do with the training of employees. And this seems to be one of a few common keys to success. If our company is going to become more environmentally friendly, or if it's going to change its act actions and activities and policies and decisions more in line of sustainability, whatever that means. The other, if we're just looking at the environment, all kinds of environmental work is enhanced by training in general. Through various kinds of training activities, people that uh, had very little to do with each other now may run into each other, particularly if we have multidisciplinary, multifunctional kind of training groups where we bring people from different parts of the company that don't have to do with each other and train them in the area of the environment. This leads to greater communication among the various employees in the company, which itself, regardless of what we're interested in, is probably going to be a good idea. We have the formal arrangement of the company. We have the further down we are, the harder it is to make those connections, perhaps, or like this or whatever. Uh, whereas as we move higher and higher up, the more likely those people in the different parts are, are talking to each other from time to time. Uh, and so therefore, this is uh, by having these sort of communications and cooperation more, it breaks the ice and it leads to the possibility of more collaboration and cooperation in new areas, perhaps the environment. So working with the environment can mean that people who had little to do with each other can uh, lead to increased communications between people who otherwise don't know about each other or parts of the company that have very little contact with each other. The more contact that we develop within a company that didn't exist before, the greater the potential for development in the company, regardless of it's the environment and sustainability. So if we establish in, in training activities where we mix employees from various parts of the company together, then we're leading to some sort of communication. Good idea. Uh, so all of that together we can see is conclusion number two, and then we have conclusion number three. <clears throat> Perhaps we need to train staff so that investments in what Lucas calls social capital becomes more successful. I've been talking about human capital and social capital is the topic of, uh, of the next lecture. Um, having to do with more the connections between people and not just the individual people themselves. And this, uh, this point here seems to suggest this point there. Uh, now we come to the last part, uh, having to do with staff appraisal and so forth. Um, and this was uh, point number five, a number of slides back. <clears throat> The questions which we can ask ourselves is what motivates an employee? And employees can be motivated for personal satisfaction. Sometimes they want to do a good job or, or whatever like that if they think that their company appreciates uh, the person in, in question. Now, we do know that getting higher wages can be a very driving factor for people to do certain things in certain situations. Uh, but it's not always the case that getting more money is necessarily going to lead to a greater amount of engagement or engagement in a new way. <clears throat> uh, so sometimes people are willing to have a not as much of a wage increase if they are allowed to do certain things that are new to them and that they are learning. And when they've done that for a year or two, then they're going to get a significant wage increase because they have broadened their competence. There has to be a linkage here between competence development and, and wage increases here. And so we can think about here that if it's not just money, then maybe we need a more nuanced kind of perspective. So we can see that rewards are very important for those companies that want their employees to work in the area of the environment. And rewards are necessary for some sort of continuity in environmental work in the company. Our interest is that our organization will have reduced environmental impacts and to achieve this, taking care of our employees and providing them with rewards for reduced um, environmental impacts, improved environmental behavior, 
good ideas that could be tried out in the area of the environment, those become essential. Now, a number of studies have emphasized either financial rewards, but a number of companies have also, another, a number of, of studies have de-emphasized financial rewards. Financial rewards are perhaps one of many possible rewards that could be given to employees. Perhaps it would be fair to say that a higher wage or other kinds of financial rewards are just one of different kinds of improvements that could be made in the employee situation. Regardless, companies expect credit for their environmentally positive activities. The credit can be coming in, in the form of fi financial rewards, but other kinds of credit and whatever credit means. <clears throat> The credit could be some sort of confirmation of uh, what they have done, that the credit could be a reward in a way which involves no per transaction of money directly to the employee, although it could involve some sort of cost on the part of the company. It's also important that not only the employee gets credit, but the credit is communicated to the closest colleagues to this person and to other employees in the company. One, on the one hand, this is for the, the, the credit that the, per, the employee needs to have, credit among that person's peers. Uh, but two, it is also a signal to others that if you do something similar, we are going to give you credit for that in some way, in some fashion. The authors continue by saying that this is not always all that easy, that it is sometimes a bit problematic. And why is that the case? They suggest that in many circumstances, it is not just the efforts of one employee which led to the environmental performance. The, change, the reduction in environmental impact or the improved environmental performance, however we're going to call it like that. And so it could be a mistake to credit just one person. Of course, it could be one person in a group, one person in a network of employees in different parts of the company that has done more. But on the other hand, that person would not have been able to be successful without collective efforts together with others. So let's imagine an employee with an idea. And the employee has the idea and communicates to the most immediate manager or boss. And then the manager permits the space for the idea to develop. You can um, spend some time this month here. I'll remove this task from you so that you can further develop your idea and then you can present it. And then we can see what we'll do. The employee does this. It's a good idea. And this leads to the realization of that. Perhaps the manager needs to have credit for this. Another possibility is without dealing with the formal levels of management that um, in a in, in less hierarchical company that the employee discusses with some colleagues and the, you have colleagues in other parts of the company and that you develop the idea. Even if this original person was the one who came up with the idea and maybe does the majority or at least the plurality of the work. And then the result is realized. So the problem here is that it would be a mistake to credit the improvements to just one, per one person. There's the idea, the space to develop the idea, and space meaning time and possible resources that might be necessary the collaboration with other people and leading to the realization after a number of months or perhaps after a year or two. Therefore, appreciation and credit is going to have to be given to the individual and the, for lack of a better word, team. Otherwise, some sort of legitimacy problem is going to arise. If this person who had this great idea comes up with a new idea and no credit was given to the other employees, then they might be less interested in participating in this person's idea in the future. And then the environmental performance of the company suffers. So all of this is tricky, says the, um, say the authors of this, but it's necessary to get this right and to learn how you're doing this and to have improvements from management 
in how they give credit and how they recognize individual activities. Otherwise, things will just sort of remain fragmentary, as they say. And then we come to whistleblowers, that somebody, and it's probably going to be a very large organization, can anonymously report on environmental problems. We have these routines, but nobody's following them. Or there's somebody someplace who seems to be actively and almost maliciously not participating in, in some of the environmental activities in the company, which is leading to some sort of environmental problems. Somebody is not reporting some problems that exist and hoping they'll just go away. Uh, and we can conclude, and I'm assuming this is still the case now, as it was in the beginning of the decade 2010 and the middle of the decade 2010, we can conclude that it's really difficult to conclude scientific studies in this area. It's very hard to conduct such a study because then you would almost have to, the researcher would almost have to have contact with the whistleblower before the whistleblower starts saying something for a certain amount of time, follows the activities, sees what happens, and also does this in a number of organizations to make comparisons. And we can see that essentially in all the cases of non-environmental whistleblowing, um, that there are a lot of people that suffer for their honesty or their feeling that there is a mistake that's taking place. And various organizations, be them in the United States, I can't point right here, or be in China uh, because of COVID-19, um, and it doesn't, that they're suggesting it doesn't really matter about the economic or political system, that there's a tendency on the part of some kind of organizations to punish whistleblowers. And sometimes managers who might agree that this was a mistake will sort of um, join ranks with the other managers in an organization. So this is tough. You have to be really sure that your whistleblowing is not going to lead to some sort of personal re repercussion. Another possibility is that you leave the organization and are well established before you blow the whistle afterwards. But your new organization might start to think, aha, you're that kind of employee. And so that could also be a problem. So you'd have to almost make sure that your new organization appreciates people that are willing to go out of the way to say things how it are, they are and point out mistakes before it becomes a much larger problem or before um, stakeholders in society find out about this. Now, why can we see some of these um, observations when it comes to um, employee uh, credit, employee rewards, and so forth. What can we see in articles having to do with this, and what might be the sort of underlying explanation? In business management and organizational studies, and also in psychology, presumably this is also in environmental psychology courses, there's something which is referred to as the Hawthorne effect. And this takes its name from an assembly plant in the United States in, I believe, the 1920s, in a location called Hawthorne, or the plant was called Hawthorne. We can think about this as a dangerous, noisy, smelling industrial facility, and it doesn't really matter what it makes. One which was maybe not entirely safe, not as safe as at least many places in, uh, in industrialized countries, in post-industrialized societies. Now, the safety of the employees is, is much more important. And what, they, and what occurred in, in this study was that they wanted to see if improvements in lighting, if the ability to take breaks a little more often, a little longer, or more regularly, or other things in the working environment changed, would this lead to a greater amount of efficiency? an additional product becoming off the assembly line per hour, or five or per hour, or ten per day. By making tweaks in the working situation, what would happen? 
And the place was large enough that similar things were taking place in different parts of the building. And so some of the employees were told that there were going to be changes in lighting uh, and why the study was carried out. And some of them were not told. There were changes in lighting or the ability to take breaks or whatever it was. And the idea on the part of the researchers was that more illumination, more breaks will mean that when the employees are working, that they are being more efficient. They can see things better. They don't have to worry about tripping over things as much because the illumination is better. Uh, they have their short breaks so that even though we lose five minutes there, we gain back something more. And yes, they could see that when there were positive changes to the work environment, that there was an effect. But they discovered something else. They discovered that the employees who were told that they were part of a study, and we were interested in seeing what the effects of the study were. Their productivity went up even if we didn't make changes in the work environment. So there are two parts to the Hawthorne effect. The one has to do with the work environment. The other one has to do with that employees consider themselves to be seen important and special as the result of being told that they were part of a study. They had been chosen to be studied and therefore, well, I better do a good job then because I've been selected among this plant, this industrial facility with thousands of employees. Sorry for about the cell phone that's playing there. <clears throat> and so this study, which is approximately 100 years old, still seems to have ramifications. And for students that don't like to hear about old literature, articles that are five or ten years old, this is still something which is talked about because it was such a landmark study a hundred years ago. Therefore, consider that articles that are five or ten years old still could be incredibly relevant and you can yourself go out and find out, find more recent articles that suggest the same thing. So what we see here is that the employees are going to feel better. Their work environment exists with some sort of inclusive form uh, of environmental work, and they can see that the potential for the company and themselves to develop. By having transparency and communication in environmental work and involving the employees and providing them with training and all of these things, here what we can see, then Directly or indirectly, employees are going to feel that they are given something and that they are going to perform well to meet, um, uh, to, to meet what the company is providing them. And we can also, although this is not directly clear from this literature that I've reviewed, but I would also suggest that there seems to be among bosses or managers or upper management, depending upon if we're talking middle or upper, upper management here, that there seems to be two kinds of interest in the area of the environment or sustainability on the part of these managers. Some are interested just in the short term. They're only going to be in this company for a few short years and move on to the next one. Their career is consisting of moving from company to company and raising their wages as they go along, regardless of what the company is involved in. This could also be in a government organization or a municipal organization. So for example, they want to get the ISO 14001 certificate for the environmental management system as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and they're going to climb on their ladder. Those that are more long-term, that have a deeper, more fundamental environmental or corporate social responsibility interest, the employees that they have under them, we need to take care of these people because this will then reflect upon ourselves and how we are developing in our career, these people who are thinking in these more long-term 
uh, and it makes a lot of sense for me and my career development, but it also makes a lot of sense for the company. It makes a lot of sense for the employees that are under me to have competence development, education and training, and some sort of participation. Uh, because then some clever ideas might come out that didn't won't come out otherwise. And so when we emphasize human capital in a given organization, uh, particularly those that are environmentally aware companies, then we can see what happens. In all likelihood, we're going to have better environmental performance than in those companies that didn't emphasize human capital. We're probably going to achieve a certain level of environmental performance faster and more efficiently and maintain this longer when we have more of an emphasis on human capital, probably. And we're probably going to have greater employee performance and productivity in general, all other things being equal. Now, a number of these things that I've said here can seem to be intuitive to us and were considered to be intuitive in the 1980s and 1990s among those that were more progressive in their thoughts about the management of companies and organizations. But it was first in this century, in the decade of the 2000s and 2010s, that there was actual scientific evidence through this. And I have scratched the surface of some of the scientific evidence of this in this lecture with these articles which I have mentioned and which I have used. So, human capital and environmental work in organizations. How can we sum this up? We have arguments in part from Lucas, and these arguments seem to be confirmed by a number of scientific articles in scientific literature looking at various places around the world at various times and various kinds of economic sectors. The more places, the more years, the more sectors, the closer we are coming to something which seems to be a, maybe not universal truth, but close to it. <clears throat> and we see those locations where we have these, and everything seems to be pointing in approximately and the same and in the right direction, so to speak, supporting arguments that Lucas was making. Uh, and these arguments that Lucas made were approximately the same time that these various articles came out or afterwards. Um, so she was unable to do this kind of review to get the same kind of results. So we see a high degree of truth behind the idea or the hypothesis. If you take care of your employees in various ways, you emphasize their learning and their skill and skill and competence development. It's good for your company. It's good for the employees. It's positive for the environmental work of your company and therefore is positive for the environment. So that's it. As opposed to some other lectures that you may have heard in a particular course, here we have a number of references. And one of the reasons for this is because this is an external kind of lecture, which can be seen on YouTube, not only among students in the environmental studies program, but anyone who stumbles across it. So I have to make sure that I have clear references here. You'll be, so seen, you'll be shown the references briefly and if you want to look at them to write down or uh, note some of them, then you're going to have to pause the recording or the lecture and take care of that and then press continue. So I invite you to continue to the next lecture, the one which has to deal with social capital. And there will be a link in the description or and or there will be a link. Uh, you can follow the link here in the here, or you can see it in the description below. The link to the lecture having to do with uh, social capital, based on Lucas's article, but also a review of the academic literature in the area. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.